Hi everyone, welcome to Andy on Crime. Yesterday, Friday the 12th of May 2023, a jury at Newcastle Crown Court convicted 55-year-old David Boyd of the murder of 7-year-old Nicky Allen. This was a murder that took place in Sunderland in October of 1992 and had remained unsolved for over 30 years. This case involved the trial and acquittal of a separate individual known as George Heron in 1993. So in this video we're going to look at two things. Firstly we're going to look at the trial in 1993 and why the police's tactics during the interview process led to the acquittal of George Heron. And secondly we're going to look at the breakthrough in this case which led to the subsequent trial and then conviction of George Boyd in this case. And then finally, I'm going to touch upon the likely sentence that George Boyd may receive as a result of being convicted of the murder of Nicky Allen. Starting with a brief overview of the case, Nicky Allen was a seven-year-old girl who lived with her mother, stepfather and sisters in the Weirgarth Flats in the east end of Sunderland. David Boyd was 25 at the time of the incident and his partner had on occasion babysat for Nicky. On the 7th of October 1992, Nikki departed her grandfather's and then went missing. A search of over a hundred people looked for her and her coat and shoes were found outside the derelict Quayside Old Exchange building in High Street East in Sunderland. Tragically, her body was discovered inside with stab wounds and blunt force trauma on her head. A police investigation commenced and the prime suspect was an individual called George Heron. He was arrested and subsequently stood trial but during the trial it was discovered that the method used by the police to obtain a confession, which was the key evidence in the case, had been obtained oppressively and therefore the judge ruled that the evidence could not be used in the trial and he directed the jury to acquit George Heron. The case then went cold for a number of years before DNA evidence showed that another individual, David Boyd, had traces of his DNA on Nicky's clothes. He stood trial at Newcastle Crown Court and on Friday the 12th of May 2023 he was convicted of her murder some 31 years after the incident took place and he is due to be sentenced in the coming weeks. If we look firstly at the arrest and trial of George Heron to understand why the case against him collapsed, he was arrested and after three days of questioning he confessed to the killing of Nikki Allen. This is against a backdrop of having previously denied murdering her on a total of 120 occasions. With that confession and other pieces of circumstantial evidence, the police were confident of a conviction in this case. At the trial of where George Heron was the figure of public hate, understandably so being the prime suspect and on trial for the murder of Nikki Allen, the judge ruled that the evidence obtained by the police in the form of the confession was obtained by means which were oppressive and he excluded the evidence. The reason the judge excluded the evidence is that police are subject to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984, or PACE as it's more commonly known, and this was in force at the time of the trial of George Heron. And what PACE does is it sets out the rules that the police must follow in the conduct of an investigation and covers things as wide as identity parades, arrests, or in this case, the conduct of police interviews. And in this case, what we have is a confession by an individual. Now, section 76 of PACE covers confessions, and I've put the exact wording of PACE up on the screen. But in essence, what it is saying is that if you obtain a confession through oppressive means, that evidence cannot be admitted into court and therefore cannot be used in trial. So you may have seen various UK or US police shows where the interviewers are using harsh language, being aggressive and essentially dragging a confession out of the defendant sat before them. That is not allowed under PACE. The police have to ask proper questions put evidence and challenge the defendant where appropriate, but they are not allowed to use oppressive means. And the judge has clearly ruled that given the number of times that George Heron was asked whether he committed the murder of Nicky Allen, and he has said on a 120 times that he did not commit the murder, the continued asking of that question 
and the manner in which that question was asked was deemed to be oppressive and therefore that evidence was excluded. And given that that was the key evidence against George Heron, as the rest of the evidence was all circumstantial, that led the judge to rule that the evidence in the case was such that he had to direct the jury to acquit George Heron of the murder of Nicky Allen, and he did so. The second thing that I want to touch upon in this case is the breakthrough that led to the arrest, trial and conviction of David Boyd, and that is the DNA evidence. Now, DNA testing in 1992 was not used routinely in criminal investigations. And if you think of the state of technology in 1992, we didn't have home computers or phones and TV was very limited. So the state of technology with regards to DNA testing was also severely limited. In 2016, the DNA profile of David Boyd was matched against that found on the clothing of Nicky Allen. Now, one thing to bear in mind, and programmes like CSI has led to a false belief into the accuracy of DNA testing. What DNA testing does is when it matches a profile, it will give a probability of how likely that profile is likely to be that person compared to someone else. So in this case, the DNA evidence found on Nicky Allen's clothing showed that it was 690 times more likely that the DNA found was Nicky, David Boyd and another unidentified individual. It did not say definitively that the DNA profile was David Boyd, but gave a high likelihood that it was. Now, this was a case where the evidence against David Boyd was circumstantial, albeit with that strong DNA indicator as part of the case. And clearly the jury at Newcastle Crown Court found the circumstantial evidence compelling enough to be satisfied so that they were sure that David Boyd was the person who murdered Nicky Allen and therefore they convicted him of murder. The final thing I want to touch upon, and I know I said I was only going to talk about two things, so you can consider this a bonus to the video, but the likely sentence of David Boyd is something I'm going to cover now. Anyone convicted of murder in the UK will automatically receive a life sentence. The question will be is, what is the minimum term that the judge will impose? And in a case like this, some people may say, well, should he not be getting a whole life order? And the rules regarding a whole life order, particularly with regards to the murder of children, are where it is a premeditated act to go out and murder a child. So in this case, we could potentially be looking at a situation where David Boyd receives a whole life order. I would certainly be expecting if the judge does not impose a whole life order for him to receive a sentence in excess of 35 years. The judge will also take into account the fact that Boyd has got previous convictions, albeit not for murder, but for instances involving children. So I think in this case, he will absolutely receive a life sentence and I think he will receive a sentence of in excess of 35 years. So to summarise, the acquittal of George Heron was as a result of the police using oppressive means to obtain a confession. The judge ruled that the police had contravened the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984 by using oppressive questioning to obtain that confession, and he ruled the evidence could not be used at trial, which was the key evidence, and without it, the case fell apart. With regards to the breakthrough, the DNA profile of David Boyd being found on the clothing was the key piece of evidence which, along with the other circumstantial evidence, led to his conviction. And this delay in using that evidence was as a result of the state of technology in 1992 compared with when it was reanalyzed in 2016. And with regards to sentencing, Given he's been convicted of murder, he will automatically receive a life sentence. The question is how long the tariff will be. I believe, given that it was a murder of a child with an element or potentially more of premeditation, that he is looking at a minimum of 35 years. And I wouldn't be surprised if the judge did award a whole life order in this case. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video informative. If you do have any comments, please post them down below. If you did enjoy this video, please consider giving it a like. And if you'd like to see more from me, please do subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching. Take care.